Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to COVID and Me, which is an EBMT webinar for patients and caregivers. My name is Bretje Verhoeven, and I've been treated successfully with a bone marrow transplantation in the past, and I'm the chair of the Patient Advocacy Committee within the European Society for Blood and Marrow Transplantation, which is also called the EBMT. This webinar is organized by the Patient Advocacy Committee together with the Transplant Complications Working Party. It is directed to patients and caregivers for patients who have undergone or are scheduled to receive a bone marrow transplantation or cell therapy. We know that the COVID pandemic is a great challenge that not only we, but actually our whole society is facing. And we are very aware that hematological and bone marrow transplantation patients, and of course their caregivers, may have particular concerns and needs. During and after the presentation by Helen Schoemans, you can pose a question in the question and answer section. And after the presentation, Helen Schoemans and Pierre Jungmann will try to answer as many as possible of these questions live. Mind you, that our knowledge regarding COVID is changing every day, and that the data in this webinar is up to date as of today, which also means we might not be able to answer all your questions, but we intend to do so. To give a broader perspective of this webinar, before we start the presentation, I will briefly explain what the role of the Patient Advocacy Committee is within the EBMT. Can we, yes, please, thank you. First, the EBMT is a non-profit organization. It is composed of scientists and healthcare providers. After consent, it collects anonymized data on diagnosis, treatments, procedures, complications, and outcomes. And this information comes from more than 500 hospitals from more than 50 countries around the world. This data is registered, and that's why EBMT is called a registry, and secured. It is then being used for research on bone marrow transplantation and cellular therapy and can lead to the development of new techniques. It can lead to changes in pre clinical practices as well as improvements in patient care and ultimately we want to have a better outcome for patients. So what role has the Patient Advocacy Committee? The EMT has many committees and working parties and the Patient Advocacy Committee is composed of a group of patients who are patient representatives from different nationalities in Europe. Actually, what we want is to ensure that patient meaningful concerns are well integrated in all of EBMT activities and organizations, and to ensure that patients' perspectives are integrated in scientific activities. We also built an educational program during the EBMT annual meeting which are called the Patient Family Donor Day and the Patient Advocacy Sessions. We build and maintain a network of patient and patient advocates and organizations in Europe. And you can always contact us if you want to know more. So let's continue. Um, so during the webinar, you can chat and you can uh, ask questions. So the chat function is when you experience technical issues. You can click on the chat icon and the panel at the right side of your screen will open, type and send your message. The question and answer section of the webinar is as follows. Uh, it is available during the whole webinar and you can write your question when you click on the three dots button, select question and answer in the open panel, Select the addressee or panelist, write and send your questions. Be aware that the questions will be answered after the presentations and not during. So, let's get started. I am pleased to present you to Dr. Helen Schommers. She is one of the hematologists and stem cell physicians of the University Hospitals of Leuven in Belgium, and she also takes part in some of the EBMT activities. Helen, thank you for being here, and please go ahead. Thank you very much, Brechia. I have no relevant disclosures for this presentation, except maybe one thing. Um, I'm a little emotional today because in the past two weeks, we've been working very hard with European patients 
and European healthcare providers, and we had a common scientific project, and what we wanted to do was single out information that was reliable and relevant for you to face the pandemic. And at the, at the beginning of this year, I was really hoping that such a project would happen, that we would work at a common scientific project. And thanks to the COVID epidemic, this is actually happening. So something beautiful is coming out of this crisis, and I want to thank very much everyone who has made this webinar possible. The second thing that I want to say again, like Brechia said, a lot of what I'm going to be discussing today is up to date as of today, but Hopefully, we will know more in the coming weeks. That's the beauty of science. And most probably, a lot of what we're seeing today will need to be reevaluated based on what we understand in the future. So let's get to the learning objectives. So the first thing we want to do is summarize for you our current understanding of the impact of the coronavirus on cell therapy and stem cell transplantation. We want to give you access to good sources of medical information so that you can keep looking for information by yourself in the future. We want to give you access to support and you know, so that you know where to go when you need help during this pandemic. We want to show you what you can do yourself and show you what EBMT is doing for you. So let's start with a little bit of vocabulary. You see here on the right-hand side, the very first picture that has been taken by this doctor um, for, of the virus, which has turned our lives upside down about two months ago. So if you look closely at that picture, you're going to see that on the surface of the virus here, you see a number of little spikes. And these little spikes are what the virus is using to get into your cells and to infect you. And because they're all around the virus, this is what we call a crown around the virus, and this is why we call this the coronavirus. And it's not because it's the king of all viruses, as my nephew said last week. However, there's something special about the coronavirus now. And this is something that they realized at the end of last year. They realized that the number of patients who were infected by this virus, which usually causes symptoms which are very similar to the common flu or to the cold, this virus, in some cases, was developing in the direction of something much more severe. And this is why it is now called the SARS coronavirus, SARS for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. It's called SARS-2 because in 2003 in China, there was a very similar virus giving the same type of severe picture in a number of patients. Now, the last acronym that we're going to use in this webinar is COVID. COVID refers to the disease that is caused by the virus. So we're talking here about the coronavirus disease, and it's 19 because it was, because it was discovered in 2019. For the sake of simplicity in this webinar, we are just going to use the acronym COVID. Now, what is so special about this disease? If we look at the 40,000 cases that have been reported in China, you can notice here that the large majority of these patients were adults. If you look at a little bit closer, you're going to see that only 2% of those 40,000 patients were under the age of 20. So this is not very frequent for a cold or flu virus that it would go um, more specifically to adult patients. This is also the reason why a number of schools have closed, because we know in the meantime that children tend to have a mild form of the disease, but they're able to give their disease to older patients who are more susceptible to complications. And that's the reason why schools in many countries have been closed. But as we just said, the majority of COVID is really a mild disease. Looking at the adult population we just talked about, the 40,000 patients from China, 80% had very mild symptoms. Only 14% had severe symptoms requiring to go to the hospital, and 5% ended up in the intensive care. However, this is the tip of the iceberg. Why? Because we are talking here about the confirmed cases of COVID. So we are only talking about patients who were tested. 
you know that a number of patients do not have access to testing, and you also know that a number of these patients are not going to be tested just because they don't feel enough symptoms to go to the healthcare professional and get tested. So this image of 80% of mild disease is probably an underestimation, and there are probably a lot more patients who have very mild symptoms who have never been tested and are not in this figure. Why is COVID such a problem if it's a mild disease? Well, in the meantime, you know that it is happening all over the world, and that's problem number one. In the meantime, we know that there are about 1 million recorded cases. Now, if you divide this by 7 billion in the world population, it gives us a prevalence of the disease of 0.001% of the general world population. But again, again. Oh, I have, um, but again here, we're talking about a number of patients who probably have not been tested um, and who are not in this number. The major problem that we have in our society today is the fact that the number of patients is increasing in a very rapid fashion and that a number of these patients are severely sick. These severely sick patients are coming into our healthcare system and this is a problem at three levels. First problem is that because they're coming into the hospital, in addition to the number of patients we usually see, we have less hospital and intensive care beds for the other diseases and interventions that we usually do. The second problem is that our hospitals have become labyrinths or, or mazes because we need two care pathways. We need the dedicated care pathway for people who do not have the virus, and we have a special pathway for patients who have the virus. So if you come into the emergency department now saying that you've had a little bit of a fever and that you're coughing, you will be regarded as a COVID patient until we are absolutely sure that you are not going to contaminate anyone with the virus. And this is making our life very complicated in the hospital because we need separate rooms, we need separate places to do um, lung photos, we need separate nurses to take care of you, and this isn't making everybody's life very complicated in the hospital. And the third problem that we have is that patients are afraid. They're afraid of coming into the hospital because they don't want to get contaminated with the virus, and so they will tend to wait longer at home before they actually take contact with us. So this is exactly the reason why we decided to do this seminar. We realize that you have less access to your standard care, and we want to give you the tools so that you can manage your disease even if you do not have the right access to the care you deserve in some circumstances. What do we know about COVID and cancer? Well, not much, but I can share a few slides with you on this topic. The first slide here is the data on coronavirus infection hospitalizations in Belgium last week. Last week, there were 1,000 patients who came into the hospital with a COVID diagnosis. And if you look at the other medical conditions that they had, you can see that what you see here is really typical of people who come into the emergency department of a hospital. A number of people had high blood pressure, diabetes, chronic lung disease. This is not surprising. Where are you? Where are the, the immunocompromised patients? Where are the hematological patients? You have here 7% of patients who had an underlying tumor. But if you look at the immune suppressed patients, they're here. Only 4% of COVID diagnoses last week in my country had a problem with their immune system. Only 2% of them were also having a problem with a hematological malignancy. This doesn't say much, but at least it shows you that the majority of patients who come in the hospital are not patients who have just been transplanted. Okay. From the literature from China, we also have a little bit of information. In the first two months of the outbreak in Wuhan, exactly where the uh, epidemic started, they looked at all patients who were coming into the oncology department. 1,500 cancer patients came in. Only two had a diagnosis of COVID. 
uh, sorry, only 12 had a diagnosis of COVID, which gives you a frequency of 0.8% of cancer patients coming in with a coronavirus infection. This is more than what they saw in the general population because they had 41,000 COVID cases out of 11 million people living in Wuhan. And this is a frequency of 0.4%. However, think again about our iceberg story. It is very likely that cancer patients who came into the department, had a little fever, had a little cough, were more likely to be tested than people just off the street. So much to say, we are not sure about what this means for cancer patients, but we are not seeing dramatic numbers, at least in what is published. Let me show you a little bit more information about what we know from China. Here you have five reports that have been published in uh, medical journals, and you can see in blue the number of COVID cases. So these are the two largest studies, and in this study, 1,000 patients had a COVID diagnosis. Of these 1,000 patients, 30 had also a diagnosis of cancer, and two had a diagnosis of an immune suppressed, an immune suppressed stage. In this other study, 1,500 diagnoses, only 18 patients with cancer. So basically, everything we know about cancer and COVID depends on the information we have gathered from 54 Chinese patients. That is not much. This is the story which best describes what happened to these cancer patients. So let, let's look at it a little bit more in detail. In this study, they have looked at the probability of developing a severe event, meaning they looked at the risk when a patient came in that he or she would go to the intensive care. This risk is here in green for cancer patients, and there it is in blue for the general population. You can see that the green line is higher than the blue line. However, in this study, we are comparing roughly 20 cancer patients to more than 1,000 patients in the other group. A number of these cancers here um, were lung cancer patients. One third had a lung cancer. So you can imagine that lung cancer patients will be more likely to go to the intensive care with pneumonia. And there was only one of the 20 cancers, which was lymphoma. In this group, the median age was 65 years as compared to this group, which was about 45 years. And there were more smokers in this group than the other group. So again, this is the information we have. And there's not much more I can tell you about cancer and COVID. So what's the bottom line? Well, we have very limited published information. And we all know that the cancer prevalence, which means the chance that you would get cancer and the type of cancer you get depends on where you live. And it's the same thing for the care you get. So what we know here from Asia is likely to be different in America, in Europe, or even in Australia. So basically, we're learning on the job and we're going to be on the lookout to try to better understand the link between the risk of getting infected and the fact that you might have had cancer in the past. Your next question is obviously, what do we know about the virus and cell therapy? <laughs> well, let me break it to you. Unfortunately, here, I have no published data to share. So when you don't have published data as a healthcare provider, you use what we all do. You use your common sense. And using our common sense from what we know from the general population, we are going to ask you to be careful if you know that you have other medical issues than cancer. If you know that you have a weak heart or if you have weak lungs, we're going to ask you to be extra careful. The other situation where we want you to be extra careful is whether if you have a deficient immune system. By this we mean if you had your transplant less than one or two years ago, if you are still taking medication against graft versus host disease, it is highly probable that your immune system is not working exactly as it should. So if you're taking cortisone, if you're taking neural, if you're taking prograft, sacrolimus, uh, cell steps, mycophenolate, those are all medications which will decrease the way that you can react to uh, microbes if you get infected. So using common sense, you need to be extra careful. What does this mean for you if you are waiting for a transplantation? 
Well, we just discussed the fact that it's more difficult to get your care. But you know that transplantation and cell therapy really involves a very complex chain of events. The donor and the patient um, are at the beginning of the chain, and obviously your transplant team is going to make sure that there is no risk of infection before transplantation. We are going to ask you to be very careful um, to isolate yourself in the two weeks before you get the transplant or before you donate your cells. And before we collect the cells, we're going to make sure that no one is infected. We will do the same before starting chemotherapy. You also know that in some cases, the cells we use for therapy are not coming from the hospital, but they're coming from the other side of the country, and sometimes they're coming from the other side of the world. Well, it's obvious that with the travel restrictions we have right now, it might be a little bit difficult um, to get the cells across. And so your transplant team is going to have to deal with that before you can start with the transplantation. You can imagine that less people might decide to donate blood in this period and that we often need to do transfusions after transplantation, so we need to be aware of this. And there are a number of medications like tocilizumab, for example, which is used in car cell therapy, but which is also being used in some severe cases of coronavirus infection. So we need to make sure that all the medication and transfusions you need are present before you start with your transplantation. One last difference is the fact that we do a lot of transplantations with clinical studies. Now, doing clinical studies is taking a lot of energy out of the healthcare. We need to collect extra samples. We need to send them. We need to collect information. And that means that at this stage, because um, some things, in, some, in some situations, things can get a little bit chaotic, a number of studies have been put on hold. So what does this mean for you as a person? Well, your transplant team is going to adapt depending on your local context. And obviously, it's going to be very different in Italy or in Sweden. In some cases, your transplant team might decide to delay your transplantation if it is not deemed to be urgent, and they will see what the safest option is for you. In some cases, they will also decide to freeze the cells before transplantation and only start with the preparation regimen once they know that the cells are in the hospital. But this is going to be adapted to your own local context. Now, what does this mean for you if you've already been transplanted? Out of the Chinese experience, we know that about 40% of coronavirus infections in Wuhan happened in the hospital. So we want to protect you against hospital-acquired infections. And in many cases, non-urgent follow-up appointments after your transplantation are likely to be postponed or replaced by telephone contact. Your medical team is going to tell you how they want to do this in your local context. The advice I can give you is to make sure that you know where to call if you have an issue. Make sure you know what the emergency number is of your transplant team, because if your appointment has been delayed, you still need to be able to contact the team if you have an urgent problem or an urgent question. Okay. Now let's look at what you can do to try to prevent getting infected with COVID. You've heard it in the media, COVID is contagious. We know that every patient infected with COVID can spread the infection to another two to three people. And this is happening with droplets. So basically, if the patient is sneezing, coughing, or speaking very loudly, it is possible that a number of droplets escape from his mouth and nose and get into the air. It's unclear to us whether this virus can infect you in the air, but it can also sediment and fall on a number of surfaces. So it, it's important to know that you need to watch out where you put your hands, and that's the reason why people are insisting on the fact that it's so important to wash them. And if you have put your hands somewhere, the last place you want to put them next is in your face, because if you do this, you're going to bring the virus directly into your body. We also know that a number of patients are incubating, meaning that between the time that they have 
been infected and the time they get symptoms, and this time is a median of about five days, it is possible that they should transmit the disease. And so therefore, you need to be extra careful. So how can you avoid a COVID infection? Well, wash your hands. It's that simple. Look at the virus again. So this is the outside of the virus, and this is the little spikes we were talking about, and that's how it gets into a cell. The way you're going to destroy the virus is by using soap, because this layer is actually fat. It's lipid. Um, and if you use soap, this layer is going to disperse, and the virus is going to be destroyed. Remember that you have to wash your hands for 20 seconds. This means you have four sides to your hands, the, the top side and the underside of your hands. And so you're going to count to 20 when you're washing your hands with soap. That's the way that you're absolutely sure that you got everything out of your fingers. Don't forget also to wash between your fingers and count to 20. Social distancing, you've heard it in the media, but let me just remind you that there are some closed spaces you're going to try to avoid now. You're going to try to avoid the elevator because it's very hard to keep two meters between you and someone else in an elevator. Um, another thing that you're going to avoid is traveling. If it's not necessary, you're going to avoid your non-essential appointments. That's what we just said. And obviously, it's also important that you should try to, lead, to live healthily. So please try to exercise even if you're staying close to home. There's nothing wrong with, with going for a walk as long as you wash your hands when you go home. And if you meet someone, you keep at least two meters between yourselves to talk. There's, um, it's important to keep sleeping. It's important to try to eat in a healthy manner if it's possible for you to do so. What should you not do? Let me just repeat it again. You do not want to touch your face with your hands. You also do not want to stop your current medication because your medication is there to protect you from medical problems which are going to bring you into the hospital. So if you uh, decide to change anything to your medication, please contact your physicians first. Do not buy or start any new medication based on what you've heard in the media. You don't want to do this because you don't know which interactions you would have with your current medication, and you don't want to take medication away from people who really need it in the hospital because they had the severe form of the coronavirus infection. But probably the best advice you need here is that you should not panic. You know what? You guys have become experts at avoiding infection. Ever since you received your diagnosis of your hematological disease, you've been making sure that you were not getting infected. You avoid people who are sick. You know how to wash your hands. You, you are walking around probably with alcohol in your pocket just in case you touch something. And actually, what I'm thinking is that you could probably teach me how to avoid infection much better than, than I can teach you anything. Now we're coming to masks. Now, every one of you know that there is a global shortage on masks. Um, there are different types of masks. You have the round N95 respirator. In this mask, um, the person wearing the mask is protecting the outside environment because the, ma the mask is tightly wrapped around the face. And this person is also protected from viruses coming in because everything is tightly sealed. Now, obviously, because we don't have enough of these respirators, we're going to keep them for healthcare providers who are working in a high viral load area. This is extremely important. In the low viral load area of the hospital, you will often see people wearing a surgical mask. This is to protect you from infection. This keeps the droplets of this patient, of, of this healthcare provider, behind the mask. And this is how we try to reduce the risk that we should infect you with any virus that we could be carrying. This is not the best mask to protect you against viruses because it's opened on the side. However, it's better than nothing, and it gives you a physical barrier against droplets. It is also possible, if you don't have yourself access to a surgical mask, that you make it yourself. And please check out our website at EBNT. We are giving you tutorials as to how you can make your own mask. 
So let's say you have access to a surgical mask or, or you've made one yourself. The very most important thing is that you know how to use it. Before you put your mask on, you want to wash your hands for at least 20 seconds because you don't want to put any viruses on the mask, which is going to be close to your nose and mouth. You're going to adjust it on your face. You're going to put the straps at the back, and then you don't touch the mask again. Because if you do, you're going to pick up whatever viruses have come onto the mask, and you're going to put them somewhere else. It also means that you're not going to wear this mask in your neck, you're not going to put it on one ear, you're not going to put it in your pocket, because every time you do that, you are putting viruses elsewhere. You don't want to do this. Once you decide to take the mask off, you're going to throw it away or you're going to wash it, because remember, any soap is going to get rid of the virus. Okay, so please remember this. If you're using a mask, put it on, put it off correctly. If you're making your own mask, make sure you have a different color at the outside and the inside to make sure that you don't wear it inside out. And once you have it on, do not touch your face to adjust it. Okay. Now, how can you feel if COVID is starting? We know that about 40% of patients will have an elevated temperature when it starts, and about 80% of them will develop this in the first week of the infection. We also know that COVID comes with a dry cough and that a number of people are going to feel shortness of breath. These are the most frequent symptoms of COVID, but there are a number of other things that you could feel. It's possible that you should feel muscle pain or maybe a sore throat and a runny nose because remember, it's very much like the cold or like the flu. Some people have said that you can feel a change in smell or taste. And there are a number of people who could feel fatigue, but this is very aspecific. And there are a number of cases where it has been shown that diarrhea can also be associated with COVID. But again, it's not because you are tired or because you have diarrhea that you have COVID. The one thing you do not want to miss is this shortness of breath. Remember, COVID is going to start as a cold, but it can go down your airways and it can go to the lungs. And this is what happens in the severe cases where the lung is impacted. Normal lung tissue is here. Normal lung tissue is black and there's plenty of air in there. But here you can see that the lung tissue has been damaged by the virus and you can see it here on this uh, photo of the lungs as well. So if you are feeling short of breath when you're taking a flight of stairs or when you're getting dressed and before you could do that without a problem, then you should worry and you should definitely call. Or you cannot walk and talk at the same time, whereas before it was no problem, then you should also call your healthcare provider and discuss what you need to do. If you get the diagnosis of COVID, I'm also asking you to contact your transplant team. If you have a diagnosis of COVID, you're on the COVID side of the hospital, which means that the COVID doctors have a lot of things to do, and they will not necessarily think of calling us and telling us about the fact that you're in the emergency room. It's very important that they also think, the doctors who are taking care of you in the emergency department also need to think about the other issues that could be linked to your transplant and that need to be taken into account. It's not because you have a COVID diagnosis that you don't have another infection which needs to be taken care of. And the third thing is, that it's important that we discuss your medication and see what you need to do with your immune suppressive therapy, the medication you take against graft versus host disease, for example. Okay. So we realize that COVID is bringing a lot of anxiety. How can you keep cool through all of this? Well, you know, try to keep contact virtually with your friends, with your family. And you can also do this with a distance. If you're talking to your neighbor from your balcony, and your neighbor is on the other side of the street, there's absolutely no risk that you're going to get COVID from speaking with your neighbor. You can also look at the solidarity around you. If there are beautiful things happening in our society, people trying to help each other. And maybe the best advice is to try to think about something else. Again, on the website, we have a number of suggestions of light links you can use to do museum tours or look at online concerts. And maybe it's for you a chance to read books and watch movies and maybe learn to meditate. Uh, there are a number of things you can do even if you are um, isolated at home. Okay. 
So what is EBNT doing with COVID? Well, as, as we just said, we have this web page where I encourage you to have a look. Uh, there are a number of links that are going to be able to help you. We are writing guidelines about cell therapy and transplantation, and these guidelines are being updated every week. We're giving you helpful links, which are all available on this website. And we have webinars like today, obviously, um, and we're also collecting data about COVID cases. So um, this is uh, what we know from now. Um, the registration study as of yesterday, um, there have been 84 cases of COVID patients uh, in transplant recipients reported to the EBMT. And not so surprisingly, the highest number of patients have been reported in Italy and in Spain. The median age of these patients is about 55 years. The majority have received an unrelated transplant. There are a number of people who received their own stem cells. And up to now, no CAR T cell patients have been reported with COVID. But obviously, we need to keep registering this data to try to better understand what this means. Um, and what we know right now is still very, very limited. So if you were to get a diagnosis of COVID, you can ask your transplant team to register this in our database, and your story is going to help us better understand this disease and better understand how to help other patients. So I thank you in advance for helping us if you were to get this diagnosis. This has brought me to the end of my presentation. I thank you very much for bearing with me all the way, um, and um, I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Helen. This is a very nice presentation. I think it's good to mention uh, also that this webinar is being recorded uh, to view for you to, la uh, to view later, and it also will be uh, translated in different languages. And all the information will be available at the website you now see on the screen. Uh, on the screen. So. Uh, let's continue with the questions. We already have some questions coming in. Um, let me remind you, if you want to have your questions answered live, uh, you have to type your questions in now. And you can do that uh, by clicking the three dots button, select the question and answer in the open panel, and send it to all panelists. So before uh, we get started answering the questions, I also want to introduce you to the panel. Um, and I'd like to welcome Per Lungman from the Karolinska University Hospital and Karolinska Institute from Stockholm in Sweden. And he's part of the EBMT Infectious Disease Working Party. And one of his roles is to collect the data about COVID cases from hematological transplant centers. Uh, Helen and Per will both answer your questions. Uh, they start coming in. Um, talking about a mask, one of the questions is if it is, if you really have to wear a mask, do you always have to use it? And this is Hélène. Um, I think I think it's difficult to say that you should always use a mask. I think you're if you're all alone in your own house, you do not need to walk around with a mask. I think if you uh, are in a situation where you could get close to people, uh, then it is probably a good idea to have a physical barrier between you and the outside world. Um, but again, um, this is not something that uh, I can uh, prove with clinical studies because we don't have any scientific information to, um, to confirm this. Um, so it is a little bit of common sense. In your own home, um, I am not sure that uh, I would advise to wear a mask. What do you think, Per? No, no not, not in our home or outside. Of course, the situation is a little bit depending on how many people are in your home, how, many, how close you are to the people. Uh, but it's going to be almost impossible in practical terms to do it. 24-7 in your own home. Okay. And of course, you don't need a mask going outside uh, unless you really expect to come close to people. Yes. Okay. But what about uh, my shoes? Do I have to take them out when I uh, enter my home? Will, will the COVID virus stick to my shoes? 
actually have absolutely no information about that either way? I would say no, um, because it, uh, it, it can live on surfaces uh, in a very experimental way or maybe for hours, maybe longer. But whether or not that can transmit the virus is unknown. And uh, you, you, I should be in good shoes the way you always do. Yes, and once you've taken off your shoes, you can just wash your hands and then you're fine. Okay, and what about um, when you're inside your home? Do I have to spray everything? How do I clean? Do I have to again, infect everything? No, again, we have very little data. I think the situation is you have to separate two situations. One is if you have somebody in your home that is infected with COVID. Um, the other situation is if you try to avoid becoming infected. In the, it's very easy to answer for the second situation. Then you definitely go. Then you keep same uh, cleaning routine as always. As Helena said before, all normal cleaning fluids will dissolve fat. That's how they are uh, uh, made from the very beginning. Uh, and then they will work as well as, uh, you know, stand, standard cleaning uh, fluids will work as soap with, with on your hand. Okay. If you have an infected family member, this situation becomes much more complex. And I cannot answer on general terms for that uh, because it's very specific how, how large the uh, apartment or house you have, how many people, what is the situation. Uh, but of course, if you have a close relative infected risk of becoming infected, Okay. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we do have seem to have some problems okay. with the connection. Uh, so maybe that can be sorted out. Um, so yes, I, I think it, it's probably a microphone problem. Pear, if you can bring the microphone closer to your uh, face without getting infected, maybe <laughs> maybe that's something you can try. I, I just wanted to Is ask. It better? Oh yes, excellent. Yes. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Um, so I just wanted to add that uh, looking at the web links that are going to be available on our website, the um, UK has given very nice guidance on how to do it if someone is infected in your home. So if you check out the link from the UK about care at home, they're giving very nice specific advice as to how to deal with one person infected in your home if there is no way that this person can be uh, moved to another location. So I think you can have a look at that, and there are a number of good things that they're suggesting um, about how to deal with that situation. But I totally agree with Pear. If no one is infected at home, there is no reason to run around with masks and be paranoid, because this is not what you would do um, in the flu season. You would not wear a mask the whole day long. Okay, so if I understand it well, that if my family member is diagnosed with COVID, uh, then I can also check some of the uh, links on the website for EBMT of how to deal with that. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. So we have more questions so coming in. Let's, let's go. What is the plan as EBMT uh, when there is a recipient patient who gets exposed to COVID? So when we have a recipient patient gets exposed to COVID-19, um, made is also affect the donor? Uh, no, uh, be because we are, uh, the donor uh, will not be affected if the patient is so do you, uh, I'm, a little, I'm a little uncertain if I understand the question. Uh, but if the patient is exposed, and then there's no risk with the donor, if the donor is exposed, uh, then there is a, a recommendation both from the EBMT and the World Marrow Donor Association to not that donor should not donate during the incubation period and sometime after that and be tested negative for COVID before donation. 
to, to decrease the, from the beginning quite small risk that any cells could be infected. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have also have here another question that if there is a vaccine available in due time, uh, will transplant patients be a priority? Oh. Um, well, the problem, as many of you probably know, is that transplant patients might not be the best responders to vaccines in the first place because of the immune suppression. So I think the answer would be what circumstances uh, will that patient be in? I don't know what Elena would say, but I would, for example, prioritize transplant patients with known pulmonary or lung involvement of Graf-Rosso's disease, for example, but then they might have double risk. A relatively healthy transplant recipient a year or two or three out would probably have the same, same priority as, as in the elderly population would be my guess, but this is guessing. Okay. I think we're just... The first thing is to make sure that we have a, a vaccine because we, we still don't have any vaccine, so it's difficult to answer the question at this stage. Okay, thank you. And um, is it also wise to postpone a stem cell transplantation for some weeks due to lack of immune resistance? The uh, BMT has put in some ideas about this, and I think it, that is the question. The big question is how high-risk disease will the patient have? And you have to do a balanced assessment. Is the risk higher going on with the transplant, depending on the COVID situation in the region where that patient lives? Or is the risk highest by waiting because then the, the kidney, for example, will progress? And that assessment can only be done on an individual basis. Um, I'm sorry, we lost a, a connection uh, pair. Uh, I will continue asking the question, and maybe then, Helen, you can ask uh, answer this question as, as pair is not available at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. one of, yeah, go ahead. OK, one of the questions uh, that came in is, um, If it's, it's the immune system effectively overreacting that is the cause of severe pr uh, problems, might the not yes. immunosuppressed patients be less likely to suffer severe effects? Yes, I, I understand the question. Now, this is because um, the corona infection is, as we said, very often mild, but in some cases, you get pneumonia, so you get an infection of your lung, as you saw on the slide. In the beginning, the virus is affecting the is is destroying your lung just by the infection, and sometimes afterwards, your immune system overreacts to the initial infection, and in that case, um, um, a, num a number of people stay longer um, in the intensive care because their body is overreacting. So the hypothesis that I'm hearing here is maybe if my immune system is not quite as strong, it will less overreact against my body. It is possible, but we have no data to confirm this, so we don't know yet. Um, but it's a, it's a hypothesis. Okay, thank you. And there is also some worry about uh, the choice of patients when it uh, really becomes severe. So. Let's say the situation gets worse, and there will be no time. There have to be time to choose between patients. Uh, a patient 32 years old with the hematological background, and another patient same age with no background of any disease. Well, who will they pick to treat? I think what we are trying to do in the majority of hospitals all over the world is try not to get into the situation where we have to choose. And we all hope that this is going to be possible in every country, that everyone gets a fair access to care. Um, however, in some very difficult situations, it is possible that physicians have to take decisions. And I think it's very important 
for you as transplant patient or as caregiver that you also have your say and that you let your transplant team and your treatment team know how far you want to go. Are you ready to go to the intensive care? Do you accept this? Or do you accept to be put on a respirator? Because it's very important that the, the team that will need to take this type of decision knows how far you are ready to go. And this is the advice that we're giving all our transplant patients in my center. Please discuss this beforehand with your team so that everyone knows what you would want and that we don't have to take this decision without factoring this in. Okay. And should transplant a patient with COVID-19 be treated by their transplant hospital because of their patient history and competency, or can they go to a different hospital? That will be very different from country to country. Um, and it depends very much on where there is enough space to uh, get you as a COVID patient. Um, again, I don't think um, it is possible to uh, ask that you are transferred to your own hospital because in some cases it will not be possible. But it's okay if your transplant team knows that you're in a different hospital um, and they can take contact with the medical team taking care of you, then um, it is also possible to be treated in a different hospital and get good care. Okay. It's also depending on how much experience that hospital has with COVID because sometimes uh, the experience with COVID is, is uh, higher than in, in the other hospital and in the transplant team because we really try to avoid to get our patients infected if we can. So, individual. Okay, thank you. Um, in case that I get, uh, there was a question of someone who said, if I get infected, am I in a bigger risk of toxicity for use of medicines to treat uh, COVID? Um, so again, this is, a, this is a very individual question. Every time that someone comes in, we're going to look at the whole range of medication that people are taking, and we're going to look at the potential interaction. So the fact that some medicines cannot be taken together, and that is something that all teams are going to do when you come into the hospital. So you, you can be confident that this will be taken into account and that a good choice will be made as to what is the best therapy for you at that moment. Okay. Now, so someone said that the only way out of this pandemic is herd immunity, uh, which is something also the, the what authorities say, which basically means that 60% of the population is, needs to be being affected. So how should we approach this situation? I think that is probably absolutely correct. Uh, this is a new virus to the human population, and we have to build immunity to it. The logical way to do it, to decrease the risk to the vulnerable, is that children, young, healthy men and women will get infected and thereby decrease the risk to transplant patients and the elderly with underlying disease. This is the, for the time being just now. There is clearly a gain in protracting this in a way that uh, the healthcare system is not overwhelmed, but also we will learn, as Helena said before, on the job. We will know better how to take care of patients with COVID and hopefully and by the end of the road somewhere, we will have the vaccine. So this is not a brief fight like it was with SARS-1. This is a prolonged fight that will be for a long time. Okay, th thank you, Per. Um, there is another question about donors. Um, in case the donor has had COVID-19, but he, uh, he recovered and feels well and can donate. The, the question is, will the transplantee be immune to the coronavirus after the transplant? That's an extremely good question that all of us would like to know the answer to, but we don't. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> let's hope so. <laughs> let's, let's hope so, yes. 
we will we will see in the future and i'm i'm pretty sure that uh, all of us will will all of you will uh, do research for that so why do you think that young healthy covid-19 positive patients are developing critical symptoms and getting intubated and and some pass away how is it possible with young healthy people that's another very good question. That the, the answer is that we don't know. Um, it, it's very clear, and Helena showed that, that the likelihood of that happening is much, much lower than in the elderly with other diseases. But it's not zero. It might have to do with the dose of COVID, the larger dose uh, of COVID you get exposed to, might cause more severe disease, which may then you come back to masks and social isolation and distance and so on to keep the washing hands to keep the dose as low as possible. But there might also be genetic factors. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have also some comments coming in actually um, regarding the, um, the herd immunity that we already spoke about. Um, so I will, I will uh, um, collect two questions. So one is, what do you think the best action should be taken after the end of the lockdown? But also, for this now, does it mean that we should hide until herd immunity is achieved? And what if we don't hide anymore and the lockdown will be ended? I let that question go to Helena, I think. Oh, <laughs> well, not to joke about it. I think the answer is again, we we don't know. Uh, uh, the likelihood of getting infected, hopefully, will decrease with herd immunity. Namely, that there will be fewer people around that carries the virus and may may might transmit it to you or another vulnerable individual. Uh, so it is a little bit of the probability game. If 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 one out of a thousand is out there infect potentially infecting you, or if it's a one out of ten thousand or fifty thousand, the the risk will go down. So I think that's one that that's the probability answer to the question. Uh, the other answer to the question is that we might be better dealing with it three months or six months or a year from now. So we know better how to treat, with what to treat, that we yeah. get new drugs uh, and thereby making the, the chances better. Yes, I totally agree. I think our knowledge is evolving very, very fast. Uh, every week we're learning new things and we're changing our guidelines because we learn new things and we learn better how we can deal with this pandemic. And so it's not because you're in isolation now that you're going to have to stay in isolation for the rest of the year because things are going to change in the coming months for sure. However, so now we as, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, well, now we're talking actually for a collective level, but what does that mean for, for patients, individually speaking? Yes, how but it's the same how for are we patients. going to do? Because for patients as well, things are evolving. And if all of a sudden we find a treatment for this disease, the pandemic is going to look very different as it looks now. And as our knowledge uh, improves in the coming weeks, we will also better be able to say who is at risk and who is not. And so it's not because you need to hide now that you're going to need to hide as, at the individual level until the end of the year. But you need to look at your own medical history. And if you have not only a, a transplantation, but also a weak heart and also weak lungs, then yes, you are someone who is at risk and you're going to need to be extra care careful this year and probably for a prolonged period of time. Same thing if you are relatively uh, old, uh, by this we mean above the age of 70, your risk is going to remain higher. And so, yes, this population of patients will remain at risk for the coming weeks and months, most probably. Okay, thank you very much. Then we have one uh, last question, I think, unless another one will come in. 
uh, which is about clinical trials, basically. And, and well, there's one question asking if you are enrolling can cancer COVID-19 patients with a trial of receiving hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Azithromycin. So is your question whether we're doing this in our center or whether this is running in Europe, or what is the question? It does not specify in which country. Okay, so I think the general answer to this question is the majority of people who are treating COVID patients in large centers are trying to uh, put a large number of patients into clinical trials which are running all over the world so that we can learn very fast what is the most efficient treatment for this disease. And so if you are offered to participate in a trial to try to understand what the best treatment is, I would encourage you to take this offer very seriously because you're going to help the people around you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, is there anything uh, you would like to add as a, to close this? Uh, oh, I do have, if we have some time, yes, I see. Uh, there are, there's one more question coming in before we uh, end the webinar. Are patients who have had an allogeneic stem cell transplantation and hematologic uh, um, stem cell transplantation uh, extra vulnerable to the corona? The answer to that is that we don't know. Uh, we are, that's exactly the aim of the case collection in the EBMT. Uh, there are two potential answers to that question. One is that we know that viral patients after adrenic stem cell transplant usually are vulnerable to viral infections more than a non-transplant transplanted individual. The other answer is that um, at least in part, the severe disease caused by COVID is caused by the patient's immune system. And if you then have a slightly depressed immune system, that might not be all bad. But the, both these hypotheses are we testing just now in collecting as many patient stories as possible to learn more. Uh, last week, it was about 40 patients in the registry. Uh, now it's 80 plus patients. Next week, it might be 120. And then we start to get numbers where we actually can look at this very important question, but we don't have the answer. Okay. And is there a difference between uh, autologous and allogeneic transplant? Probably, but. I don't know. Uh, I, I would say many autologous patients are older uh, than the average allogeneic patient. That is the difference. And obviously, the autologous patients have their own immune system, while the allogeneic has another individual. So, in most other situations with viral infections, there is a difference. But to predict which way that difference would go and what the results would be is today is very difficult. Okay, thank you very much. Well, before we uh, close this webinar, I would like to thank you very much for this really nice presentation and asking, answering all the questions that came in. Um, I want to remind everyone who is listening and watching this webinar that all the information uh, can be found on the um, uh, on our website of EBMT shortly, including multiple languages, which will be translated. And last but not least, I would like to um, invite Helen Schumas to say the last word, maybe. Thank you very much, Brechia. Um, I want to thank everyone at EBMT, um, the staff, uh, the people in the marketing department, the people who are doing the e-learning, um, all the leadership that has um, supported us in this project, Pear, who has taught me a lot of things about COVID, about transplant, about infections, you, Brechia, who uh, has coordinated the whole patient effort around this. Um, this has been a, a beautiful project, and I hope we can do similar projects in the future. Don't hesitate to send us your 
um, your feelings about this um, webinar. Tell us how it was for you, how we can make it better the next time, what kind of things would help you to get through the pandemic, and we will try to organize something like this in the future again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. And see you next time.